today is a good day to talk about resilience. But first I'm going to talk about superheroes. Superheroes are everywhere these days in movies and television. The Avengers, Guardians of the Galaxy, The Arrow, Flash, all imperfect, complicated heroes trying to save the world. <coughs> the original superhero, for me at least, was Superman. He was brought to movie life in the 1980s by the impossibly handsome Christopher Reeve. And Superman was the ultimate good alien from the planet Krypton, dedicated to protecting the Earth and its people. Now, Superman has had many incarnations since then, but Christopher Reeve has always been my Superman. And Reeve himself certainly seemed to be a super, more than the average Joe, man. A privileged New Englander, he was educated at the Ivy League Cornell University and the prestigious Juilliard Acting Academy in New York. He shot to stardom just at age 24 with Superman. And he continued on in a strong career, acting with some of the best in the business, from Katharine Hepburn to Michael Caine. He had a beautiful wife and three beautiful children. Physically active and adventurous, he flew airplanes, uh, piloted a sailboat, and rode horses competitively. And then came the accident. It was front page news for weeks. That perfect man, a celebrity star, struck down by tragedy. The man of steel undone. In May of 1995, Reeve was competing in a horse jumping and dressage event in Virginia. And in the second event of the day, he and his horse buck were in a cross country race. And on the third fence, his horse buck started to jump and simply stopped. Reeve had his hands tangled in the bridle, and he went over Buck's head, and unable to get his arms free, landed right on his head on the rail. He broke his neck. From Superman incarnate to quadriplegic in seconds. Reeve had the worst possible spinal injury, unable to move from his shoulders down or breathe on his own. He was 42. And in the days after, as he began to realize just how bad his situation was, he said, well, he mouthed the words to his wife, Dana, maybe you should let me go. Reeve could not imagine living without travel, adventure, and athletics. Paralys paralysis, he said, created an indescribable void. Dana told him she would support whatever he wanted because it was his life and his decision. But she would be with him no matter what. And she asked him to wait two years. And if he felt his life was not worthwhile, she would help him find a way to end it. And she looked at Christopher and said, you're still you and I love you. And Reeve said these words, you're still you, saved his life, made living seem possible. She was able to see him and not his injury. He felt the depth of Dana's love and commitment and decided that his job was to find a way to cope and be a productive person again. And he looked at his three children and saw that they were so glad he was still alive and realized that he had to find a way to continue being their father. And making that choice to live was the beginning of a new life. A different life from before, but a good life. One that held meaning, purpose, and love. Christopher became an esteemed film director and an activist for paralysis research. His foundation has raised millions to fund groundbreaking research and provides financial support to those living with spinal injuries. <coughs> and by the time two years had elapsed after the accident, Christopher knew, despite the very lim real limitations of his body, that he was glad to be alive. And this is the power of resilience. 
People who are resilient are better able to harness their inner strengths to rebound quickly and more fully from setbacks. And they know how to ask for help in recovery. Christopher Reeve was a resilient person. He chose to live, and having made that decision, he was determined and focused enough to get through those difficult days of rehabilitation. And, and I don't say this lightly, it was easy for Christopher Reeve to be resilient. He lived a life of privilege. He had people to pull him through the dark days when he was struggling. He had access to the best doctors and the most expensive medical equipment. He could afford the extensive renovations on his home. He could pay for full-time staff to care for him. He could create a really good quality of life with all the resources he had. And being resilient is much harder when you don't have strong support systems. Now, Christopher was very aware of his privilege, and in the end, he used it to advocate for others. His voice at federal U.S. health funding hearings brought substantial increases to medical support for spinal injuries. And he was tireless in raising awareness, speaking across the country anywhere he could. So Christopher had the inner strength to come back from the depths of despair. And he had access to an incredible amount of support, which allowed him to share his gifts and contribute to society. And sadly, in October of 2004, after an evening spent watching his teenage son play hockey, Christopher became ill and passed away from heart failure. But his story shows us the real power of resilience when you have both inner resources and external support. Even the worst of situations can be overcome and you can find a way to live well. Now the good news for all of us is that resilience is not a character trait that you either have or you don't. It's a combination of thoughts and attitudes and behaviors that can be learned. And the good news is that while we may not have the resources of wealth and celebrity, we at UCM do have people to turn to in a crisis. Each other. Community matters. Before I speak more about what resilience looks like, let's hear from the choir. An ancient image for resilience is that of bamboo bending in the wind. While well, the mighty oak can crash down in a storm, broken, the bamboo just sways with the wind and remains intact. A more contemporary image might be that of the 70s kids' toys, Weebles. Weebles were little egg-shaped people, and when Weebles wobble, they don't fall down. Resilience is about flexibility in response to trauma. It's about adaptability to change. And it isn't innate character trait. It can be taught. And at the forefront of resilience training is the United States Armed Forces. We all know the old image of the soldier, John Wayne, strong and stoic. Showing emotion is to show weakness, to exhibit mental distress is weakness. To ask for help is weakness. Just be John Wayne. So it's not surprising that combat soldiers really struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder, high rates of depression, and suicide. And the US Army has finally figured out that that culture of stoic strength is not a healthy one and does more harm than good. And so now resilience is part of their training strategy. Leaders are learning to model the importance of seeking help when struggling, and soldiers are taught very specific skills to maintain physical, emotional, and spiritual resiliency while in the field. They are taught to stay healthy by eating well and having a fitness regime. They are taught to change their thought habits and develop different attitudes. Catastrophic thinking, imagining the worst case scenario, cascades into anxiety and poor judgment. And so soldiers are taught that when they imagine the worst case scenario, they also need to imagine the best case scenario. 
So for example, when they're overseas and they phone home and their partner doesn't answer, if they assume it is because the partner is in bed with someone else, they are asked to then assume that the partner has actually won the lottery and is out buying a new car. <laughs> and this is to help them understand that both scenarios are extremely unlikely and help them find their way to that middle ground and more balanced viewpoint. And soldiers are taught to look for and focus on the positive moments in a stressful situation. And so for the 50 people who throw stones at American soldiers in Afghanistan, there will be one who invites them in for chai and conversation and seeks to build a bridge. So the soldiers focus on that one person and building that connection. They're also reminded that events in and of themselves are neutral. They happen, they are what they are, it is what it is. And emotions are just coloring our understanding of it. And so soldiers are taught that they can actually control their reactions to an event. One optimistic soldier, after being captured in the Gulf War, spent her time feeling grateful to be alive, rather than upset that she had two broken arms and was being held as a prisoner of war. And research has results suggest that the resiliency training has made a difference. Catastrophic thinking is declining among soldiers who have taken the training. Soldiers report feeling more focused and prepared, as well as better able to look after one another. Not all of us find being resilient easy. We can't always find the positive in a situation when we're in the moment. And we can't always redirect or control our emotions. I can get stressed out writing an email. So I'm pretty sure if I was a prisoner of war with two broken arms, my strongest emotion would not be gratitude. But I've never had formal training in resilience <coughs> strategies. But I do have the talus. Unitarian Universalism can help us develop resiliency. One key aspect of resiliency is positive self-regard. You have to consider yourself worthy in order to get through stressful times. It's easy to play the blame game or feel that a problem is all your fault or it's because you're worthless. With positive self-regard, you can move past the negativity. And our first principle says that each of us has inherent worth and dignity. When bad things happen, we still have value. We are worthy of love and care. And when you are struggling, remind yourself that this is true. You have inherent worth and dignity. And if you don't believe it, call a friend and ask them to remind you. Come here and look at our chalice flame and remember that you are welcome. Nourish your spirit with the six sources. Spend time in meditation or in nature and reconnect to the larger whole. Come here and remember you belong. Reaching out to others, being part of a community is as important to resiliency as personal strategies. Having people to turn to matters. So come to this chalice community and remember you are not alone. Christopher Reeve did. Superman was a Unitarian Universalist. He and Dana found their way to a local congregation in the years after his accident, finding it a good fit for their independent sense of spirituality. And Reeve once said that he had spent years becoming a Unitarian without realizing it. Reeve considered his church to be a place where people can be true to themselves, where the core belief is that people are doing the best they can as they struggle to love themselves and one another. He found our faith filled with compassion. And our spiritual orientation helped guide Reeve's moral compass. It helped him use his power and influence to help others, and it helped him to live a life of meaning and purpose and love. Ultimately, resiliency comes down to hope. 
and the image Christopher Reeve used was of a lighthouse, that strong, stable building on shore lighting the way, not to build on false hope of asking for the impossible that what is would not be, but a real hope based in the possibilities of the future, a real hope based in the possibilities of the love and care of those around you. Unitarian Universalism made a difference to Christopher Reeve. And my hope is that it makes a difference in your lives as well. I hope all of you feel the truth of our first principle and know that you are worthy just as you are. I hope that here you have found a place that helps you sway in the winds of change, bending, not breaking. May we be beautiful bamboo, flexible, adapting to the ever-changing events of our lives. May we know we are not alone. So say we all. <laughs>